I'd like to welcome you to uh, the special session one on uh, the security implications of cyber and technological competition. We want to talk about uh, a, a range of issues. Regional defense establishments are, of course, grappling with multiple challenges emanating from emerging technologies. Uh, the war we currently are witnessing uh, in Ukraine has demonstrated the centrality of some of those technologies, uh, perhaps not of others that people have uh, expected. And all of this has implications, of course, for future conflict in the Asia-Pacific. Um, the competition between China and the US uh, increasingly focuses on the technological domain uh, in areas ranging from artificial intelligence and advanced uh, semiconductors to quantum computing and others. And this special session will be an opportunity to examine the rapidly changing nature of security challenges linked to advanced technologies and discuss how these might be managed. My name is Bastian Gigerich. I'm the director for defense and military analysis at the ISS, and I will be your chair for this session. Um, you will have noticed that uh, the Director of uh, National Intelligence, Avril Haines, uh, has not taken her seat yet. Uh, 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 she's on her way, and uh, we will uh, be joined by her momentarily. Um, we will, however, get going, uh, given that we uh, are on a, on a tight schedule uh, today and throughout the weekend. So it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Okano uh, Masataka, the uh, Deputy National Security Advisor in the Cabinet uh, Secretariat of Japan. Uh, and uh, to my right and to my left, uh, I'm joined by Brigadier General Edward Chen, who is the Defense Cyber Chief of the Singapore uh, Armed Forces. And to my far left, we have uh, Silvina Stomkos, the Vice Minister of National Defense of Lithuania. Uh, a very warm welcome to uh, each of you. I've, I've asked our speakers to uh, kick us off uh, each with a statement of five or six minutes or so, um, and then we'll turn to uh, discussion and, and conversation. Uh, uh, Mr. Masataka, if I can ask you to take the floor, over to you. Yes. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So my name is Okano Masataka, Deputy National Security Advisor of Japan. And it is a welcome surprise for me that the very first session of this year's Shangri-La Dialogue is, is on cyber security. It is surprising and uh, a great surprise. Last year, I was in this hotel to listen to my boss, Prime Minister Kishida's keynote address. And I was involved in the preparation of this speech. And I did not expect then that I would prepare for my own presentation the following year. And two weeks ago, G7 summit, as you know, was held in Hiroshima. And it proved to be a summit of historical significance with substantive uh, discussions. We invited not only G7 leaders, but also the Republic of Korea, Australia, as well as countries that are sometimes referred to as global south, such as India, Indonesia, Vietnam, Comoros, Cook Islands and Brazil. Additionally, President Zelensky was present. The leaders reaffirmed their commitment to cooperation for a peace, full and stable and prosperous world. While the leaders' discussions covered a wide range of dis issues, including politics, international security, nuclear disarmament, non-proliferation, economy, climate change, digitization, food, health, development, energy, as well as the situation in Ukraine and the Indo-Pacific, you name it, it is obvious that a secure and reliable cyberspace is essential for concrete cooperation in any fields. So we can say that cybersecurity has now become the key to international cooperation and is a foundation of national security for all countries. And cybersecurity cannot be secured or insured by a single country alone. In December last year, Japan unveiled its new national security strategy, committing to fundamentally strengthening our own 
cybersecurity capabilities and enhancing collaboration with foreign partners. If you have an interest in the context of this national security strategy, I'll be happy to address that during the Q&A session. In my opening remarks, I would rather like to share my frank views on some of the key challenges we policymakers face regarding the given topic, cyber implication, security implications of cyber and technological comp competition, hoping to provide material for discussions. First, we have often experienced cases where government services and infrastructure facilities are forced to shut down due to cyber attacks coming from foreign sources. The boundaries between wartime and peacetime have become blurred and gray zones are in constant presence. In addition, the scope of national security has expanded to include non-military sectors such as economy and te technology, blurring the boundaries between military and non-military domains, giving rise to hybrid warfare. As a result, the traditional system, for example, relying on the, the established dichotomy between police functions and defense functions is no longer sufficient to address the current situation. A whole of government approach is necessary. Second, the notion that the national security is solely in a government issue is no longer applicable. Historically, governments have taken on the role of defense against traditional security threats. However, a different approach is now needed to address emerging challenges. Many cyber attacks are carried out through or targeted at communication and control devices owned by private companies. Numerous networks are managed by private enterprises, emphasizing the need for users to take sufficient cybersecurity measures as the first line of defense more, uh, against any cyber threats. At the same time, cyber attacks are becoming more sophisticated highlighting the importance of collaboration between the government and the private sector in terms of information sharing and incident response. Our goal is to create an ecosystem whereby cybersecurity can be autonomously and sustainably ensured in cyberspace. Building national consensus regarding the respective ro roles of the government in the private sector is not only a technical challenge, but also a political one. Lastly, I would like to emphasize the importance of diplomacy, not because I'm a diplomat, because I believe it. While some countries have the luxury to continuously and significantly increase their defense budgets, many countries cannot afford such a luxury. Enhancing capabilities to respond to threats is important, but at the same time, we cannot give up efforts to reduce the risk threats. We place great importance on sharing awareness of existing potential threats with partner countries, countries attributing and publicly announcing problematic activities, sharing best practices, establishing standards, and building upon systems to minimize dependence on specific countries. Through dialogues at all levels, including among leaders, we aim to foster trust reduce threats, and most importantly, reduce miscalculations. So I believe these, there, these three points I have mentioned are challenges that many countries, many policymakers commonly face. Thank you. Deputy National Security Advisor O'Connor, thank you so much uh, for, your, for your remarks um, and for speaking about how, how these new challenges that you mentioned um, also are a challenge for the, the way in which we traditionally have uh, tried to organize ourselves in government. You spoke about the need to build an ecosystem that is uh, fit for purpose in this, um, in this sense, and you spoke about the importance of uh, diplomacy. Um, uh, Avril Haines was just engaged in defense diplomacy, and uh, 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 thus was uh, slightly delayed, um, uh, but her motorcade made up some time on the way, so uh, I'm very pleased uh, that you're uh, with us now. Um, uh, uh, the Director for National Intelligence um, in the United States. I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you.
Thanks very much. And I have a feeling that uh, Kanasan has already said everything that needs to be said on this subject. <laughs> so what I will say will just be a duplication. But first of all, thank you so much to the International Institute for Strategic Studies for fostering this remarkable dialogue. And I think it is uh, an extraordinary moment for both the East and the West to come together to really better understand each other and and to think through how we can address the major national security issues that we're facing. And I also welcome the opportunity, obviously, to discuss you know, the security implications of cyber and technology. To begin with, I think global and regional events such as COVID-19 pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine really brought to light the very tangible national security consequences of disruptions to our supply chains, including key technology supply chains. And in order to avoid disruptions with significant economic and national security implications, we need to promote resilience. And in order to remain competitive in key technology sectors, we must support innovation and protect our, internet, our intellectual property. And while I'm sure that there are differences among us in our focus on these issues, I suspect there is a fair amount of commonality, whether it's artificial intelligence or quantum computing, biotechnology, semiconductors, and advanced energy generation and storage. These are just some of the key sectors with each having potentials to revolutionize our way of life and how we conduct defense and intelligence work. And with a wide range of applications, for example, artificial intelligence has the potential to revolutionize industries, economies, military readiness, making it a critical area of competition and a necessary area for cooperation. Across the board, U.S. intelligence services are focused on understanding the national security implications of these technologies and preserving U.S. access to resilient supply chains in these spheres by supporting global economic competition. And to do so, we recognize that it is essential that we improve our capacity to partner with the private sector on these issues as we recognize that much of the cutting edge innovation that is happening in key fields is happening in the private sector. We need to work with them to understand what is at the edge of innovation and to think through the consequences of their work, including how to address the potential national security implications. And we also, of course, spend time trying to think through how adversaries might use such technologies, and not simply through the lens of how they might weaponize such technology themselves, but also how they might use control over natural resources or other critical ingredients of a relevant supply chain to coerce other countries. And again, I think the lesson to be drawn is that we need to work with partners to find ways to push back against such coercive measures. And relatedly, we are also observing our increasing trend in cyber attacks, particularly attacks on critical infrastructure which are rising in prominence and becoming more normalized. These attacks allow adversaries to cross borders and disrupt a country's critical services to its citizens like power, water, and transportation. And while most of these have been conducted by criminal operators who use ransomware and hack and leak operations against industries like healthcare and education, nation state actors have been engaged in this realm for years and are increasingly joining the mix, often using criminal actors to do their bidding. And that's why the United States has put a focus on mandating cybersecurity for critical infrastructure and has engaged extensively in existing and new cyber partnerships via the Quad and the Global Counter Ransomware Initiative to share intelligence and cybersecurity advice and capabilities. And the US government's heightened awareness of cyber threats to our critical infrastructure is a driving force behind a number of cyber defense measures to improve the private sector's cybersecurity posture by heightening awareness, sharing best practices, strengthening information sharing. And I'll list just a few of these measures to give you a sense of our work. First, we're trying to lower the thresholds for reporting and have asked for network owners to do so for reporting suspected malicious activity. And second, we're trying to make more information publicly available. Specifically, we're increasing the amount of information we release to our private sector both to help combat the rise in cybercrime and recently in our efforts to posture industry for potential Russian cyber attacks. We're also working hard to increase our outreach to the private sector. In fact, recently our Department of Homeland Security partners 
held over 90 engagements with more than 10,000 partners on cyber threats. And this also includes sharing preventative measures to help those partners manage vulnerabilities. And finally, we're facilitating hunt teams on networks. In other words, we have asked company owners to actively hunt for known cyber techniques, tactics, and procedures on their networks. And to facilitate this, we've provided lists of vulnerabilities and indicators of compromise to look for on company networks. And one of the challenges we face, both with technology and the technological sector and cybersecurity, is the pace with which new technologies are being developed and proliferated, which is faster than companies and governments can shape norms, protect privacy, prevent unanticipated and dangerous outcomes, particularly ones that are designed to preserve the benefits of such technologies while mitigating against the risks. Recent advances in artificial intelligence offer great potential to increase productivity and accelerate advances in numerous fields, which we must not forget as we are trying to simultaneously avoid the negative national security implications and impact, which includes potentially lowering the barriers to entry for those looking to do harm and fueling the rapid development of asymmetric threats to our collective interests. Moreover, the significant and rapid breakthroughs we are seeing are also heightening the risk of technological surprise. As the recent news surrounding large language models illustrates, it is difficult to predict when developments will result in technological leaps and how these leaps will impact totally different technologies. Ultimately, to support the affirmative vision that I suspect we all share in which people around the world use secure digital technologies to safely and openly engage online, reliably receive critical services and information from their governments, benefit from the technologies that are being developed and drive inclusive economic growth, we'll need to work with partners on global technology and cyber developments and cooperate with all nations but this cooperation requires trust and complying with the rules, including the protection, for example, of intellectual property. I think I pretty much ended where my colleague did. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that, was, that was fascinating. And I, I think the, the, issue, the range of issues you've, you've outlined around partnership and the, and the different um, uh, elements to, to consider, um, uh, uh, the, the pace of innovation, the, but the information flow and the trust uh, that, that enables either this to work or, or turns into a, uh, an obstacle. Um, I think we'll, we'll want to come back to that. And, and I know there are obviously private sector representatives around the room who might have views as well and be uh, encouraging to hear from them in the discussion period as well. Thank you very much um, uh, for that contribution. I'll now turn to uh, Brigadier Chen, over to you. You're looking at this from a slightly different perspective, yes. uh, namely as a cyber chief of the armed forces. Over Thank to you. you. Thanks, Dr. Chen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Director Haynes and Okana-san has spoken at the geostrategic and nas national levels. But now let me add, the uh, add to the conversation by suggesting another perspective uh, at a more technical and operational level, which I think is also important to appreciate for this topic. A month ago, I met up with Gao Nagli at the sidelines of the RSA Cyber Conference in San Francisco. He was a 25-year-old white hat who discovered the first critical vulnerability in ChatGPT, which could have been exploited by hackers to take over other users' accounts, view their chat histories, and assess their billing information. When I asked him why he focused on ChatGPT, his answer was a simple but interesting one. To him, ChatGPT is the new internet, one that will fundamentally transform how we create and consume information as a society. This is a clear reminder that we are operating in an age of accelerated digital disruption and intensified technological competition. To stay one step ahead, we need to rethink three paradigms, threat, terrain, and partnerships. Firstly, in terms of digital threats, we as security practitioners have to widen our apertures from monitoring clear conventional red lines involving state actors to also dealing with different shades of grey involving a mix of state, non-state and even third-party actors. To exacerbate this problem, the nature of threats keeps evolving. From supply chain risks to ransomware, the list just adds on. And now, with generative artificial intelligence, threat actors no longer need state-level resources or expertise to do harm. Just last week, a tweet containing a fake AI-generated photo of an explosion at the Pentagon 
purportedly caused a brief dip in the US stock market. While the impact was limited due to the swift clarifications by the local fire department, this could be a chilling precursor. It wouldn't be long before a threat actor misuses multimodal generative AI to generate a tsunami of fake news, hyper-realistic images, and deep fake videos in a coordinated disinformation campaign, overwhelming our ability to discern truth from fiction as a society. Secondly, while we contend with increasingly sophisticated threats, we also have to prepare ourselves to operate in an expanding terrain. As we learn to fight AI with AI, we have to be able to experiment with such new technologies in a safe and controlled environment. As generative AI sees mainstream adoption, we will also need to protect them against new vulnerabilities like the one Gao Nagli found. Our cyber defenders will need to be able to constantly discover, understand, and protect against new attack vectors like prompt injection attack, adversarial AI, and AI data loss prevention, just to name a few. Lastly, to defend across the expanding threat surface, we will need to transform our partnerships, like many of our speakers have spoken about and emphasized, to address the challenges of mandate, access, and expertise. One clear example is in national critical infrastructure, like power, water, and telecommunication sectors. Militaries are highly dependent on such critical infrastructure services. However, they may not have the legal mandate or network access to defend forward. On the other hand, the operators of these critical infrastructure systems may lack the requisite cyber capacity to defend against high-end malicious cyber actors. At the same time, private companies, especially major tech companies with specialized technical expertise, may not know how to come forward to help. While we may not have all the answers, now let me share three uh, recent examples of how the Singapore Armed Forces has approached these challenges. First, we established the Digital and Intelligence Service, or the DIS in short, as our fourth branch of the military in October last year, the first time we've done so in more than 50 years. As a dedicated service like the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, the DIS is tasked with dedicated operational focus to tackle these emerging and nebulous cyber info threats in the digital domain. We have also embarked on building the SF Digital range over the next three years. It will allow us to experiment with nascent technologies like generative AI and innovate on new operational concepts to defend against the latest digital threats. It will also give us, from a cyber defender's perspective, a first-hand look at new digital technologies to understand the potential vulnerabilities and threat they may pose to our military networks and platforms. Secondly, on the domestic front, we have forged strong partnerships with our National Cybersecurity Agency, CSA, and as well as various critical infrastructure agencies in Singapore in the past year by focusing on practical collaborations. One example is the inaugural National Critical Infrastructure Defense Exercise that DIS led and CSA supported last year. Together, we brought over 100 frontline cyber defenders from across 16 critical infra infrastructure agencies in Singapore for a week-long hands-on keyboard cyber exercise. It was centered on defending against simulated ransomware and op uh, operational technology attacks using our critical infra replicas that we have built together with our local academic and technology partners. With the very positive responses from the agencies and participants alike, we will be increasing the scale and complexity of the exercise this year. Through these civil, military, and public-private partnerships, we will bolster our collective national cyber defense. At the regional level, we also aim to engender similar practical cooperation through the ADMM Cybersecurity and Information Center of Excellence, or ACICE in short, which will be officially launched here in Singapore next month. The ACICE seeks to deepen cooperation amongst ASEAN defence establishments in both the cyber and information domains through the information sharing and capacity building. One example is the ACIC malware information sharing platform that allows ASEAN defence partners to share real-time information on cyber threats and malware in our region. We also see ACIC as an open and inclusive platform for cooperation. We look forward to bringing ASEAN's partners and friends regional and international organizations, as well as non-government entities 
who have the relevant expertise. Ultimately, we are clear that this is an infinite game. To win together, we need an infinite mindset to always stay one step ahead of the threats and thrive in this expanded terrain, most importantly, to forge strong partnerships. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussions. Brigadier General, thank you very much for, for um, including these practical examples of the, the adaptations and innovations that you have been engaged in uh, here in Singapore and, and, and in, a, in a multinational uh, setting as well. I think those are very, very useful and very fruitful to, to think through the, the threat terrain partnership uh, uh, framework that you have provided us. Thank you very much for this. And uh, last but certainly not least, I'd like to ask uh, Sivinas Tomkus, the Vice Minister of National Defense uh, from Lithuania, to take the floor. Vice Minister. Uh, thank you, and thank you for this uh, opportunity. Good afternoon to all. And uh, uh, let me look at this uh, topic for the lessons uh, from Ukraine. And uh, be frank with you, uh, being from Europe, and specifically from the uh, from, uh, Baltic region, uh, when we talk about war in Ukraine, uh, the first thing that uh, comes uh, to mind is not cyber or technological warfare. Uh, for us, uh, war in Ukraine uh, sends a very clear message that, uh, first of all, we have to be prepared for a full-scale uh, military attack. And uh, that's why, uh, both nationally and in NATO, uh, now we are you know, focusing more on building uh, conventional capabilities for deterrence and defense. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it would be very difficult to deny that uh, uh, cyber or emerging technologies uh, uh, are integral integral part of uh, of this uh, of this war in Ukraine, and uh, uh, it's integral part uh, for both sides, uh, for Ukraine and for Russia. And uh, if you look, uh, and this this topic uh, becomes more more important uh, if we look uh, from a broader perspective and at the broader perspective and uh, at. Uh, our other opponents uh, acting not only in, in, in Europe but uh, uh, globally. And uh, uh, so what are the main, uh, the main lessons and uh, takeaways uh, from our perspective or from uh, the country uh, near to Russia and uh, uh, carefully watching what is going on in, 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 in Ukraine? So uh, first of all, uh, uh, with regard to, uh, to cyber, uh, the obvious thing is that uh, uh, we have to prepare, uh, we have to be prepared for all scenarios. Uh, and uh, of course, cyber activities uh, can be uh, more casual for uh, spying purposes, uh, but uh, as it was mentioned already, uh, we can experience uh, uh, large scale attacks uh, paralyzing our critical infrastructure. And um, uh, what we see now in, in, in Ukraine, that uh, uh, cyber activities uh, is also uh, going hand in hand uh, uh, with uh, uh, kinetic operation. And uh, that's why we think, and our assessment is that uh, uh, we have to develop full scale of capabilities uh, in order to uh, deter, prevent, uh, detect and defend against uh, uh, cyber attacks. It also was mentioned, and uh, uh, the second lesson, our the lesson is from war in Ukraine, that uh, uh, civilian military cooperation is critical. Uh, in Ukraine, the main target of uh, cyber attack is critical infrastructure, and uh, which is often used not only by civilian, uh, but also by, uh, by uh, for military needs. And uh, it sends us uh, uh, the message, and uh, it, it means for us that uh, uh, we have to invest not only in uh, capabilities to protect this infrastructure, but also we have to invest uh, uh, and to bring closer civilian sector to the defense, uh, increase their awareness, and also you know that uh, they could know what is the role of civilian sector in uh, the case of war, 
uh, and how to interact with uh, uh, militaries. Uh, the third point and, uh, you know, takeaway is about the uh, need to involve uh, uh, additional set of uh, stakeholders, private sector uh, uh, and even uh, private companies and even individuals. Um, for Ukraine, um, the support of big companies uh, was a critical one. And uh, uh, we also saw wide uh, uh, use of hacker groups uh, and activists. Uh, from Russian side, for example, uh, one of the most active and well-known uh, uh, was Killnet, and uh, we were targeting not only Ukraine, but uh, you know, countries uh, uh, around uh, the globe. Uh, but uh, Russia became also uh, a target for, uh, of independent uh, uh, hackers itself. So we have to be prepared for that uh, as well. A few words uh, on uh, emerging te technologies. Uh, definitely, and indeed, uh, uh, Ukraine now is uh, uh, a testing ground of uh, artificial intelligence uh, and other emerging uh, technologies from intelligence uh, to targeting or even to social engineering. Uh, some may say even that, uh, uh, that uh, it is uh, the game changer in, 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 in the war. Um, but uh, from our perspective, uh, and uh, I think that uh, these technologies should be seen not as a separate solution, but as enabler, uh, enablers. And uh, our success uh, will depend on uh, how we uh, incorporate uh, uh, these technologies or artificial intelligence to the existing or future uh, military capabilities. And as we, I say, uh, we, I mean individual countries, uh, I mean international community, uh, like-minded alliance, uh, um, like-minded alliance are key. Uh, in cyber dimension, uh, we have already uh, strong, strong ties uh, between Europe, uh, United States, and uh, countries from uh, in, in the Pacific region. But uh, when it comes to the emerging uh, technologies, it is more difficult. Uh, and uh, these difficulties come uh, because uh, countries are at a different stage of developing these emerging technologies, uh, because there are a lot of uh, sensitivities. Uh, but uh, I think it's uh, a need uh, uh, at least to agree uh, among us that uh, some common understanding is needed as uh, our adversary is already using this uh, uh, emerging technologies and uh, artificial intelligence. Thank you, I will stop here. Vice Minister, thank you very much. I think that's, again, was a very interesting set of remarks um, uh, and uh, uh, you know, there, there was lurking in there perhaps the challenge to, to turn to new technologies, how to deal with them, how to integrate them, while also um, uh, recapitalizing some of the more conventional capabilities that, that certainly the war in, in, in Europe uh, has also underlined. And then, and then you ended on that note of there may be uh, being a, a future interoperability uh, uh, problem, um, uh, even within or among those countries that are used to working together because of the different way in which they have embraced and turned to emerging technologies. So that, that gives us a very rich menu uh, to, to work off. And I think uh, it is interesting that all, all speakers in one way or other have, have talked about the, the, the blurring of the lines and, and, and areas of responsibility and the need to come up with new ways to respond to an evolving uh, uh, threats of, threat uh, landscape uh, of which partnerships are, are one one of the answers, uh, even though they're difficult to arrange and to set up. So we now have uh, uh, nearly an hour for for discussion. Um, just to uh, uh, remind everybody, you need to if you haven't most of you have done so already, but if you haven't done so already, you need to insert your batch into the microphone unit in front of you. Uh, your name will appear on the on the unit, which is always helpful for me. Um, uh, and uh, that gives you the opportunity uh, to enter the queue here for uh, uh, questions uh, and comments. Um, uh, once you have put your uh, uh, batch into the, into the unit, uh, if you then press
the uh, speak button on your unit. You will hear register on my, on my fantastic piece of technology right here uh, uh, that you would like to seek the floor. Um, uh, your microphone is not live yet when you have done that. Um, I can turn uh, your microphone on um, uh, from, from here. Uh, and uh, uh, we will take a few, uh, we've got already uh, six or seven people in the queue, so I'll take maybe uh, a first round of, of three um, contributions and then uh, we will uh, return to the panel and then we'll have another round uh, and, and see how we, how we get going. So the first one um, uh, is uh, my colleague from the IISS, Robert Ward. I think your microphone is on now. Robert. Uh, thank you, uh, Bastian, and thank you, <coughs> panel. Uh, a question to Deputy National Security Advisor Okano, if I may. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the new national security strategy, which uh, we've just been talking about at the previous session and, and was, as I think you said, uh, historic in many ways. But as part of the, um, uh, the, the, part of the changes that the NSS is, uh, is, is positing, um, there's a push by the Japanese government to enhance Japan's cross-domain capabilities. Uh, and as part of that, Japan's government intends to sharply expand the numbers of personnel um, engaged in cyber-related uh, units. But Japan, like some other countries, also has a shortage of uh, people with relevant skills in some areas. Uh, and there's also competition from the private sector for talent. Uh, how does the government plan to tackle this? Robert, thank you. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll give, we'll give uh, 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 Okano-san a, a minute to think about that one. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll, take, we'll take one or two uh, more. Um, Bill Amit, Chairman of the Trustees of the ISS. Uh, let me turn on your microphone. There you go. Uh, thank you very much, Bastian, and thank you also to the panel. And my question follows on from Robert Ward's uh, in many ways, really to all the panel. The question is, um, we sort of roughly know how, how governments need to think about uh, conventional military resources, um, with how many tanks, how many ships, whatever you need. Can you tell us how you think about what is the right amount of cyber resource to have? How do you, how do you conceptualize? How much is not enough? Bill, thank you very much. That's, that's an excellent question. Um, we'll take uh, uh, maybe two more. Um, Dimitri uh, Sivastopoulou uh, of the Financial Times. Uh, I'll turn your microphone on. There you go. Thank you. Um, I have a question for uh, Director Haynes, which is, now that you've been in the role for you know, a little over two years, how do you assess China's, both its defensive and its offensive cyber capabilities? And a question for Okano-san, if I can. A few days ago, I was taking my kids computer shopping in Akihabara, and I was stunned to see how many Huawei products were on sale there. So I'm curious, does the Japanese government worry about the extensive Huawei products in Japan. Is that a, is that a cyber issue for you? Thank you very much. And I'll take one more, uh, Douglas Greenlaw. Yeah, uh, Director Haynes, um, your position was established in part to overcome shortfalls in previous stovepiping between government agencies. Um, how do you feel we're situated now given the much broader cyber and information threats that are more significant than the kinetic ones that we faced in the past. Thank you, Doug. Uh, so let's return to our panel um, for a, a round of responses. There were a few questions that were directed specifically at uh, some of our speakers, um, but at the same time, some of these elements uh, uh, I think uh, uh, apply to all, uh, including the question of how much cyber is enough and how do you know. Um, so let's perhaps, uh, Director Haynes, if I, if I may ask, can I start with you, um, uh, pick up the, the specific things uh, asked of you in specifically and then, and then also the general points, please. Sure. Uh, um, so to Bill's, <laughs> right, what is the right amount of cyber resources and how do we think about this? I, Honestly, um, let me start by saying that the policy community's uh, expectation of what the intelligence community can do is here. <laughs> and, and in other words, 
It is astonishing to me uh, the degree to which there is um, just a, an expectation that the intelligence community will be able to tell where it is that every cyber actor is and uh, ultimately be able to manage uh, sort of indication and warning for that. And, and that is never where we will be ultimately. I mean, I think, and, and to, to contribute the kind of resources that would be required to do that would really take almost our entire budget to do. And, uh, and I think it is a part of, um, you know, the overall answer in my mind is that uh, we are not going to be able to um, defend against every possible attack in cyber. We have to actually design our systems in a way that mitigates essentially the risk um, of what damage can be done when you do have attacks. And, uh, and then obviously to do everything you can to ultimately create greater resilience and to defend against them. But, um, but I would say that, uh, you know, one of the, so we, we work hard to make sure that we can essentially do the best that we're able, given the priorities that we have. The place where there's a lot of uh, discussion is how much, so state actor cyber threats, obviously we're responsible for and we need to make sure that we're monitoring and providing the right intelligence to policymakers for. When it comes to criminal uh, cyber attacks, which are increasingly a challenge and often a national security risk, um, that's the space that I think we're still trying to figure out how much do we devote our resources to that, how much, uh, you know, what, how do we decide essentially what is the right cutoff in a sense um, for that. Sorry, I'll try to make this faster. On, um, she's really a good question on how do we assess China's offensive and defensive capability. It will not surprise you that I cannot go into significant details, so I will just give you a general answer. I, I think uh, it's getting better, and, um, and they are certainly quite capable. Um, and, uh, and increasingly, I'd say, uh, aggressive and uh, incorporating it into their planning um, across the board. And uh, so I think that's a obvious concern. And then finally, to the question about ODNI's uh, role and the level of integration in the U.S. government, I, what I would say is that, um, as you say, we were you know, we were set up as my institution, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, was established largely out of a recommendation from a commission that was done that looked at the lessons learned from 9-11 attack, where we did not connect the dots, so to speak, across our community. And if we had, we would have had a better shot at really uh, sort of providing the kind of warning that we needed to. And that was in the context of terrorism. And I would say that we have really come a long way in terrorism. And, um, and I'm you know, we are not in the same place that we are now in terms of our integration with respect to cyber, to your point. Uh, we are certainly getting better, but it is one of the things that we've spent a fair amount of time thinking about is how do we take the lessons that we learned in our counterterrorism work and bring that to uh, cyber. And there are some similarities and some differences. And I mean, among the similarities is the need to integrate across law enforcement and national security in an effective way. Um, but that is, uh, you know, obvious to everybody, I suspect. But in any event, I, I'm improving. Thank you very much. Okano-san, may I ask you to pick up some of these points? Uh, Mr. Wall's question is the most difficult and last question I wanted to expect. And uh, this is a nightmare for us, not only for us, but every country. I guess that uh, there's an absolute shortage of uh, human resources uh, specialized in cyber uh, technology. And so we have to form, train young people at high school level, at university level. These are the things that the basic thing that every country can think about and we are introducing that as uh, a possibility. And also that uh, we, are, may, we, we may have to think about the possibility or, or system that allows a kind of a revolving door so that uh, exchange of personnel between private sector and the government sector, so that working in the uh, government sector with a low salary still gives you a badge of honor. The fact that you worked for the country can be used uh, as an advantage in when they go back to private sector. That kind of system 
may be needed, but this is not a system that the government takes the initiative to create. Maybe it should happen naturally. So how to reach that point is a big, big issue. And another aspect of uh, cybersecurity is that how to make up this lacuna or uh, a lack of human resources by using AI so that some security companies and uh, our global tech are already working on using AI to enhance our cybersecurity uh, capability and each government is already working on that and we, we may resort to that kind of capability. What is the optimum level of cyber forces? I don't know actually. I think that optimal level or the how, how much do we need involves a concept of a balance, balance of power. And I don't, I don't think that we have reached a point that uh, we are already uh, clear about other partners or possible players concerns level of cyber, uh, cyber capability yet. So that our approach is still that to do our necessary things to defend our country sufficiently. So that's where we are right now. About the Huawei products, and I've never been to Akihabara to look for Huawei products, but still <laughs> mobile devices. And um, our policy is that if there's a, a risk for anything, I mean security reasons, in the government procurement level, that we will eliminate certain products for that reason, not for the name of that uh, 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 mobile or devices. But we, let me add one more thing, that when it comes to uh, 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 infrastructure projects and uh, we are advocating right now open RAN system so that the security or trusted vendors can participate, not a single vendor, but the several vendors that are trusted to, to work on one project, that would be more efficient, more trustworthy, and economic. And this is a concept that we try to uh, 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 expand and work on, work with uh, other partners. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Brigadier General. I'd like to cycle back on the Bill's question on cyber resource. Um, our view is that in the digital and cyber domain, resource is not just defined by quantity, but by quality. In other words, um, talent is capability in our eyes. And I think we challenge ourselves to ask, you know, we talk about the 25-year-old, you know, white, uh, international white hat that can hold his uh, you know, own in, in the cyber circus. How can we, if he's a Singaporean, how can we bring him into the DIS to serve the country? And um, our conclusion was that besides having a very good regular career construct, we also want to leverage our national service, uh, which is our conscription service in Singapore. And under this, what we call the 13 to 30 uh, talent plan. So what we have done is that uh, it comes in three parts, all the age from 13 all the way to age of 30. Um, so what, what we do is before enlistment, we actually are rolling out together with partnership with CSA, uh, this national cyber talent program called the Sentinel program to go down to the middle schools, to the high schools, to actually interest uh, students in cyber and to actually work with educators to actually train them up to have real hands-on keyboard cyber skills so that by the time when they reach um, the age of enlistment of 18, they really, we have, a big, we have a much bigger pool of people that we can tap on. And when they are in, um, we have what we call the Cyber NSF Work Learn Scheme. So what we do is that we, um, we actually allow them to, to do part-time study at the university, but in, in exchange, instead of just serving two years full-time, they serve um, additional to about three to four years in total length of duration. And after when they enter our reserves, we continue to track them and put them in operational uh, NS uh, roles to do cyber duties. And also, we also have the um, enhanced expertise deployment scheme to also look for other digital talents that we might have missed and also to bring them into our NS uh, reserves. Thank you very much. Vice Minister, would you like to pick up some of these? Thank you. Um, it's, it's obvious that, uh, you know, in, in such small countries like uh, Lithuania, it would be uh, very difficult to reach the level that uh, we could say uh, that uh, we have enough resources to respond to all, all cyber, uh, full spectrum of cyber, cyber threats. Uh, and uh, it was mentioned already that, you know, it's, it's about uh, uh, quantity and quality. But uh, I want to like to highlight uh, uh, one additional aspect from, uh, from our perspective that uh, 
it's uh, very important to ensure this uh, uh, international cooperation uh, and uh, to share uh, knowledge, uh, to share knowledge, experience, uh, and, uh, in, and information. And that's why uh, we held uh, uh, Cyber uh, Champion Summit uh, last uh, month in in in, in Lupiania. and uh, that's that's why we established a regional cyber defense center and uh, inviting uh, all like-minded countries uh, to join uh, uh, you know with uh, their expertise this center you know in in order to to be better pre prepared for uh, to counter uh, uh, hyper, uh, cyber threats thank you very much we'll now have an opportunity to hear from uh, uh, another uh, no, get another round of comments and questions from uh, the group here uh, I will turn to uh, first to uh, Senior Colonel uh, Zhu from, from China. Um, uh, sir, over to you. Okay, thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm very glad to join the discussion. And the topic is very important to uh, everyone of us in the world, I think. And uh, I'd like to thank our speakers and for your presentation. You mentioned that and the security related with the cyber, with AI, and some other new technologies. Uh, we need cooperation. We need to uh, cooperate more and more in the world. So uh, perhaps my first question goes to uh, Madam Haynes. And from your uh, professional evaluation, and we, we may uh, quarrel a lot, but we need work together to cope with the future um, uh, security challenges, such as the chat GBT and some related the AI. And just a few days ago, a lot of scientists and, uh, and in, 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 uh, entrepreneurs, they addressed the such uh, uh, challenges, just like the pandemic, uh, atom bomb. Uh, so uh, how do you evaluate such um, potential challenge to uh, our, the world security internationally? And what's your suggestion to um, how to uh, push forward China and the US to cooperate uh, for the future? This is my question. And the very short comment, and I would, I'd like to say that uh, some friends uh, talk about uh, Huawei, and yes, perhaps uh, not uh, many people you, you didn't use Huawei products, so you don't understand what the security issues. And I remember that one of the former minister from UK, uh, his name is Vince Campbell, the former business innovation and technology minister, once said um, the security issues related to Huawei products it has to do nothing with uh, uh, national security. But the United States told us to do so. Uh, so perhaps this is true. Um, so I'd like to, uh, to say, everyone sit here, how many you once used the Huawei products and how you understand the risks of security issues and what they are really. And Huawei company, they are openly want to cooperate with the world and try to solve problems and to understand what the security problems is really is. So I, I will stop here and thank you. Senior Colonel, thank you. Thank you very much for that question and uh, your comment that I'm, I guess might trigger more comments, but uh, we, we shall see. Uh, let me turn next to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Chung from uh, Singapore. Thank you. So my question is to Director Hines. Um, one of the things that you talked about was partnership, and I get uh, that perhaps that might be easier with uh, close U.S. allies. But for uh, others that are not, um, one of the things that we're being told is, well, the U.S. presents um, uh, provocation, it pre presents uh, destabilization, presents potential cyber risks as well. So if you think about you know, U.S. Um, technology firms uh, pulling out uh, of Russia and uh, affecting them, well, those things could happen to other states should they fall on the wrong side of the United States. So um, in this regard, uh, I guess the point is there's, there's a l level of suspicion as well. Um, how would you sort of 
try to build partnerships with those sort of um, actors that might, you know, you, you might find, be, find it worthwhile, but uh, stand outside of your sort of uh, circle of close allies. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, that, for that question. Um, and uh, next, uh, uh, Dr. Fitriani uh, from Indonesia and also a member of the ISS uh, Southeast, Southeast uh, Asia Young Leaders Program. Yeah, it's on, your microphone's on. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Fitriani and I'm one of the young leaders um, in Southeast Asia. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is um, the inward question and the outward question. The, um, the inward question is uh, how likely is your respective country to utilize the artificial intelligence technology and to what extent? Um, um, if and if the guidelines have been produced on that, um, what are the limitations you impose in an ethical form to its utilization as, to the extent of my knowledge, uh, that the global norms has not, have not been adopted on, or agreed upon this new technology? And the second is on more of you, how do you advise um, uh, countries that are small and medium uh, that is not producing its own cyber and technological uh, technologies, yeah? As, because we're, as, we're only as strong as our weakest link and all countries are somehow interconnected these days. So um, how do you provide advice to small and medium countries in the midst of cyber and tech competition of great powers with the limited resource available? And not, um, as um, Brigadier General Chen saying, not uh, every country has the talent capability as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll take one more for this round, and then we'll we'll return to the panel. We will, I think, then have time for a final a final round of contributions. Um, and uh, I'd like now to call on uh, Mihoko uh, Matsubara from uh, Japan. Thank you. Um, so I'm very struck by the comment made by the Lithuanian uh, vice minister saying the importance to increase the awareness of critical infrastructure companies about their role to play in wartime. And I'm wondering if you can kindly share on how Lithuania is doing. And I'm also I'd like to ask the same question to the other speakers. And how do you do that? The, the awareness raising uh, before the war actually happens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so again, a, a, a rich menu to uh, pick and choose from uh, as we go through the panel uh, one more time uh, for uh, responses. Uh, Avril Haynes. Thank you. So, um, I think the first question was, uh, how do you evaluate the challenge of uh, chat GPT and, and recommend cooperation uh, with China? So I think in terms of how I evaluate the challenge of chat GPT, I, I would say that we are still in the process of evaluating the challenge, frankly, of chat GPT. And, and I think like so many technologies, part of the evaluation is trying to understand uh, what are the implications for society as a whole in terms of disruptions potentially to labor force issues, to other things that we're trying to understand? Uh, and that's a part of what we in the intelligence community are trying to outline for our policymakers, um, even as we also try to identify the opportunities that it presents. And, uh, and then some of the sort of, you know, specific national security threats that we're focused on. And I think among the ones that we recognize uh, are obvious in many respects, but the potential for disinformation, you know, basically deep fakes, creating a variety of issues um, and imagining how that might uh, interact with already what we see as election influence and interference issues uh, around the world. And then, um, you know, concerns about uh, the potential of using large language models and so on for uh, doing more sophisticated hacking and variety of other things. So maybe leave it at that. And then in terms of 
of um, communication with China, I absolutely think that we should be talking to China, to others, to really both to understand what the issues are and how it is that uh, you know we all think about the concerns and whether we can develop uh, and think through guardrails that are appropriate standards and other things that are uh, you know, going to ultimately help us um, to manage the national security threat while you're still trying to take advantage of the opportunities of the technology. And then I think very much related is the question of, so you know, if, if, the, if others perceive us as uh, um, provoking in some way, and I'm, I guess it's hard to, to respond to that without knowing specifically what you have in mind. I think in the context of Ukraine and, and Russia, I would say when another country violates international law in such a absolutely gross way, frankly, and uh, conducts the kind of tragic uh, invasion that we've seen in the context of Ukraine, they should expect us to react and uh, to do so quite strongly. And I think, um, you know, the, the challenge is that in the kind of multilateralism that helps us to cooperate, uh, it is really built in part on trust and trust that you are in fact going to be complying with the rules that you've agreed to. And so um, I think uh, other countries um, should uh, do their best to comply, and when they don't comply, they should expect that there are going to be reactions to that and that it will hamper cooperation. Um, I, at the same time, I think it is absolutely critical, even when there is distrust and even when uh, you are facing, in effect, um, adversaries, that you still try to work through and cooperate on issues where there's mutual interest and, uh, and also to try to manage uh, the potential for escalation or um, disputes. So I think, uh, you know, it, one does not preclude the other in a sense. And then um, in terms of uh, how likely is our country to utilize artificial intelligence, I, I, we already do try to use uh, artificial intelligence um, technology in a variety of different ways. Um, and and I think your next question, if I understood it, was how do you ensure that you're doing so in an ethical way and consistent with norms and so on? And I think it, this is an area where we've published uh, our artificial intelligence principles. We have uh, tried to promote them in different ways, I think in the context of international cooperation. It is something that in the intelligence community we take very seriously. We have uh, a variety of mechanisms for doing so. We have a civil liberties and privacy and transparency office. Um, each element within the intelligence community has an officer uh, along these lines. They are the ones actually who formed a council who worked on the artificial intelligence uh, principles with uh, other parts of our government that were focused on this, including the Office of Science and Technology and Policy. And, uh, and this is something that we incorporate into our work because I think it's another fundamental aspect of our responsible use of technologies and uh, maintaining, frankly, the um, legitimacy to continue to use them in ways that we think are acceptable and uh, promoting essentially a better uh, approach to these issues. Leave it at that. Use of AI is a big challenge, and we are using use of AI, uh, generative AI, but how do you control that? Big question is, that can we really control generative AI? I mean, that, the question presupposes that the government is able to, so whether we should introduce regulation or not. In order to properly control generative AI, we have to resort to the technology of generative AI. So we have to ma master, we have to understand generative AI. Big question for us is that generative AI is developed by private sector, not the government sector. So that whatever, even if you want to control, you cannot stop that. How to live with that? It's a big question. So the Japanese government um, recently set up an AI strategic council. Uh, at current stage, we identify, they identify the point to be discussed in the future, like uh, data protection or, for example, um, how to prevent a criminal use of AI, how to prevent disinformation, or how to prevent sophisticated cyber attacks, and uh, 
uh, how to use education purposes, uh, for education purposes, generative AI, or copyright, these are the things. And also, uh, uh, national security dimension is also there. So we have to, uh, uh, also, uh, another possible uh, 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 dimension is economic security, too. But, so we have to, wh wh whatever measures you take, I think that we should do that in a very transparent and accountable way, in cooperation with other countries, and so that uh, we can introduce a kind of a criteria or guidelines or, or common standards internationally accepted. This is something we may aim for. Maybe you can say that uh, we should try to introduce law, but law cannot make regulate efficiently uh, or, or timely enough the, to keep up with the rapid space speed of uh, uh, progress, develop, uh, progress of technological development in this domain. About uh, how to sensitize uh, 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 cybersecurity in a small uh, 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 medium countries, and I know that you're not talking about Indonesia, so that uh, maybe small countries, uh, uh, Capacity building is very important. So, for example, Quad is doing a massive capacity building program, particularly targeting in, in the Pacific uh, uh, countries and also uh, Pacific countries, uh, 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 island countries. But also what I want to emphasize is that uh, kind of a, a campaign, sensitization campaign is very important. Like uh, by just introducing a double authentication is, or asking uh, your people to change passwords frequently can help prevent uh, security, cyber security attack in your computer system, in your system. VPN, cloud security, these are also uh, uh, two, two, two uh, vulnerable points, and you have to sensitize the protection by using security software for that. These type of basic things are quite efficient for uh, 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 many, many users. And so that combination of these type of basic things and uh, uh, introducing uh, 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 capacity building training or assistance, technological assistance from outside would be a possible solution. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Okan-san. Uh, General. Chan. Just like to add on to what Okana-san has spoken about AI regulation, um, I think one comment and two suggestions. Uh, first, I think we see AI like science. It's very difficult to regulate like physics, biology, you know, uh, chemistry. How do you regulate science? Um, I think the suggestion, I think, is two. Uh, two. Uh, first, to be practical, I think we need to look at the use cases. We, adopt, we should adopt calibrated risk-based application-centric um, uh, risks or, or use cases. Um, so what I mean by that is the order of magnitude of risk when you consider, say, a generative AI-enabled classroom training versus a generative AI-enabled level 5 autonomous military platform, it, it, they are of a different order of magnitude. So I think we should think, put that into consideration and really adopt a very sensible way to regulate AI. Second, um, I think to expand on the idea about this um, public-private partnership, we must recognize that uh, generative AI is, is really at a very nascent stage. The emergent val uh, properties of generative AI is only re re discovered in less than half a year ago. So I think we must be very, ca be very careful to know that this is really just a start. Uh, and I think the point is to really bring in the tech builders, the people who are really building the technology to come into the room to really explain and share with us and also allow us to have access to the technology so that we can try it out, understand the implication and rem the, the safety and security ramifications. Thank you very much. Vice Minister Tonkos. Um, yes. Just uh, the thing is that uh, uh, we have to agree all that uh, countries are at a different stage uh, of using uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, just uh, to remind you that uh, the, first, the first summit of uh, artificial intelligence in defense was held just uh, this February in, 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 in Netherlands, uh, uh, you know, Netherlands together with uh, uh, 
uh, South Korea organized uh, this, uh, this summit. And, uh, you know, we have some kind of, uh, in, in, in our region, in, 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 in my country, in Lithuania, uh, we see that private sector, uh, sector is using artificial intel intelligence, but uh, uh, for, for defense, uh, for, uh, for military, it's, uh, it's a new topic, actually. And uh, it, it is, uh, you know, it, it confirms that uh, we are totally at, at a different stage. And, uh, uh, and uh, first of all, we, uh, we have to edu educate. And I say that, you know, having all the discussion on artificial intelligence and use of artificial uh, intelligence, uh, we, we say that we, was, we should start with education. Uh, we see some, some benefits uh, and uh, uh, even on operation and, and tactical level, uh, and uh, you know, some some uh, colleagues from uh, bring some examples from uh, from uh, uh, from Ukraine, uh, but uh, uh, but having this in mind and uh, uh, you know and education, it, I totally agree that uh, uh, the second point is you educate and to teach of responsible use of uh, artificial uh, intelligence. Um, the thing was raised also on, on uh, uh, protection of critical infrastructure. And uh, uh, that was the question. And uh, just uh, uh, to, to highlight that uh, uh, before the Ukraine, uh, it, it was uh, an understanding that uh, uh, we, we are in, in, in peacetime it, in, in, and it will last uh, until forever. Uh, and, uh, you know, despite the fact that, uh, for example, we are always saying that, you know, and from defense side, and, you know, that uh, you should always uh, be prepared for, for war, uh, but, uh, but the thing is that uh, it was some kind of uh, uh, disconnection uh, uh, with the uh, private sector and with uh, critical, critical infrastructure. And uh, from the first weeks uh, uh, of war, uh, it was like a, 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 a warning call for us uh, that uh, we should care not only about our defense sector, uh, but uh, uh, about critical infrastructure, because if the first targets uh, were critical infrastructure. So it's, uh, and uh, in, in, in my introductory words, I, that's why I, I bring to it as uh, one of the most, uh, you know, one of the, the topic that is uh, on the table and the important topic uh, that we have to ensure this interconnection and, you know, uh, and interlinkage and understanding uh, uh, between uh, defense sector and uh, private sector when we are talking about uh, uh, protecting critical infrastructure. Thank you very much. Um, so we, we've got 15 minutes left. I, I have uh, uh, six people on my list. Uh, we'll, we'll close the list here. I'll, I'll call on those six. I'll ask you to make your point in 60 seconds or less. So have one point, please. Um, uh, and then we'll go uh, back uh, for uh, uh, concluding thoughts from the panel. I'll, I'll alert the panel that I will go in reverse order for the final uh, uh, set of contributions. So Vice Minister Tompkins will go first in answering and, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll end, end up with Avril Haynes. Um, so six people, um, be quick, make one point. Uh, and the first one is uh, Professor uh, uh, Chen from China. Thank you. I, I think my question to uh, Ms. Madam Haynes, um, among your colleagues of uh, intelligence community, have you ever imagined what will be the worst case scenario in terms of security scenarios related to or caused by the revolution of those AI or any other digital technology in the next five years? Thank you very much, uh, both in terms of brevity and significance of, of the contribution. Um, uh, next, uh, from the ISS and uh, Japan, uh, my colleague, uh, Maiko Togashi. Thank you, Vice Chen. Uh, my question goes to Okano-san. Uh, you mentioned the scope of uh, security expanding and the need for whole government approach, and I'd like to ask you about competing interest. Uh, technology competition and security comes with costs, uh, not only defense budget increase, but also rebuilding supply chains in various industries as well. 
uh, Japanese national security strategy states uh, one of the goals of creating the cycle of growth and security. Um, so how Japan will exactly achieve these two competing interests? Is it about the prioritization or about the cooperation or is there any other solutions? Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And uh, next is uh, uh, Maria de Haas Matamoros from Mexico. Thank you. Um, a question for the panel. I think you already said a lot of it. Um, but what is the role of human intelligence in the era of independent cyber intelligence? And intelligence human. done by citizens, common citizens. The democratization of uh, cyber intelligence by common citizens. Which are the skills that we need to develop uh, in order to strengthen our human capital against the ever-evolving cyber threats that AI can now gen be generated by the common citizen? Thank you very much. And uh, uh, next on my list is uh, from uh, uh, Thailand, uh, Professor uh, 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 Tihinan. Thank you. Um, what should smaller countries be thinking about and be concerned about? What are their main uh, security risks, um, vulnerabilities, fertilities? I mean, the cyber security, cyber technology, the, 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 the top the discussion we've been having is that big countries talking um, largely, uh, except with the exception of Singapore, which is you know, very forward-looking, very uh, uh, proactive. Uh, but the other countries in this neighborhood, we have a lot of smaller countries here. What should they be thinking about if they have low cyber capacity, um, security capacity? Uh, what are the main risks, main, main concerns? What, how should they be preparing and thinking about it? Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, uh, from uh, Vietnam, uh, Dr. Uh, Vic uh, Tron, please, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Jinrich. Uh, so my question is to all the speakers. Um, so, you know, like uh, to accommodate uh, the increasing demand for digital applications and cyber technologies, uh, more countries are launching their own satellites to space. So I think there's a linkage between uh, cyber and space domain here. So in, the, in your country, how do you think about this issue? Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, from the ISS and Japan, uh, Yuka Koshino. Thank, thank you, Bastian. Um, I think the, I have a question to the panelists. I think we talked a lot about the impact of the large language model and generative AI and the impact on cybersecurity, um, but I think we haven't heard much yet on the impact of quantum computing um, to cybersecurity. And in the Young Leaders panel that we had in the morning session that I chaired, um, we did talk about investments, the need for investments in post-quantum crypt crypt cryptography. So my question is, where do you see the real competition happening in game changing, changing technologies looking further in, in the future um, to ensure cybersecurity? Okay, thank you very much. So we've got, a, a, again, a, a rich menu ranging from worst case scenarios, uh, 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 the link between uh, cyber and, and, and space, quantum computing, the, uh, 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 the issue of uh, 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 human talent and, and, well, the human factor in, in this technology conversation, um, uh, among other things. So uh, we've got, uh, 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 90 seconds to two minutes for, for each speaker to, to, to respond. So I'll give you permission to be selective. Um, uh, pick, uh, 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 pick one or two of these issues that you, that you feel uh, you might want to speak about. And if you have any concluding thought that you feel you want to offer, please do that as well. Uh, and I'll start this round with uh, Vice Minister Tomkus. Um, yes. Let let me brief and uh, let me, you know, uh, finish with uh, a general ob observation. Uh, so um, we almost, we, we say that we already have a, uh, you know, worst case scenario uh, in Europe. We have a war, uh, really war. It's large scale, large scale uh, war. And, uh, uh, you know, and uh, we see some uh, some aspects of the war of 20th century, and we see the aspects of 21st century. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, cyber, uh, we talk about electronic warfare, uh, but the same, uh, uh, you know, 
we talk about tanks, trenches, aircrafts. And uh, uh, this brings me uh, to the point that, uh, you know, uh, paraphrasing uh, Fukuyama, that history is back. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, we have to be prepared for uh, full, full scale, uh, uh, you know, uh, scenarios, including conventional and, uh, and, uh, and uh, how this uh, might be affected by new technologies uh, or emerging technologies or artificial intelligence. Uh, after the Cold War, uh, uh, it was like uh, the question for defense planners, uh, you know, uh, uh, what kind of war or conflict uh, uh, will we have to fight? Uh, but uh, I don't know, it's, uh, is, this question is still, you know, uh, relevant. Uh, maybe we should be back uh, to the uh, Cold War period and think about, you know, what kind uh, of specific opponent uh, we have to fight. Vice Minister, thank you very much. Brigadier General Chen. Thank you. I'll take the question on the, uh, how to strengthen our, the skills of, of our cyber defenders in the age of a generative AI. Uh, I think probably there are two things to focus on. First, I think we have to come to re the realization that we probably have to fight AI with AI. And I think with that, we probably have to teach our cyber defenders how to do the new AI-centric kind of skill set. For example, prompt en engineering, learning how to really write prompts to, to tease out the right kind of responses to, so that you can up your defenses. Um, and uh, probably the second part is uh, probably double down on some of the human skills. Um, I think the skills about communication to, I mean, incident response, working with large number of stakeholders, not just from the organization, but from other critical infrastructure agencies, must really be able to communicate and bring the team together. And I think there's also the part about empathy. I think really, you know, bring the, the non wearing not the non-technical hat, you really need to have empathy. i give you a, probably a small story. I think when we tried to, in, within the Ministry of Defense, when you try to improve our phishing click rate, uh, one of the things that we sort of did was not to do more training. One of the things was that we did a design thinking about what, you know, who the, the people who are clicking are and what, what are they, what's going through their mind and how to break the chain. And our conclusion was that actually the thing they fear most is not training. The thing they fear most is having to talk one-on-one -on -one with their bosses. So when we made it compulsory <laughs> that every time when someone clicks something wrongly doing one of phishing exercises, they have to do a one-on-one -on -one compulsory with their department heads. The numbers of the, the fishing rate just fell like a cliff. Yeah. So I think that, that, that I think to wrap it up, um, I just want to re-emphasize, it's very interesting that the four panelists all spoke about, although it came from different angles, different countries, but we all spoke about the need to protect our national critical infrastructure, and I think the need for civil military partnerships as well as a public-private partnership. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's a good example of uh, uh, the, the, the very well-known uh, tradition of Singapore to come up with creative solutions to, to, to these kinds of challenges, uh, Brigadier General. Thank you very much. Okano-san. Thank you. Uh, concerning Tobo-san's question, um, so national security strategy, we announced this, and strategy is about prioritization of uh, policy items. And if you lay out everything in a national security strategy without any accent, it's not a strategy. It's just an enumeration of policy choices. And we have wanted to avoid that. I think that this national strategy is very much peppered. I mean that uh, uh, there's a spice in the national security strategy. Say in a sense that uh, in the current situation, we have to, have to enhance our defense capability. But another problem is that all countries except for some luxurious countries, are suffering from fiscal debt. And how to do that, with, uh, uh, how to put, push forward your policy uh, objectives or priorities within the constraint of the budget? That is a big question mark. And that, that's why that our government introduced a nice concept of, new concept of new capitalism, focusing on a GX, green evolution, a tra transformation, and digital transformation and human-centered uh, economy development system. Uh, so we will continue to uh, foster or put an emphasis on uh, economic growth by structurally addressing, uh, structural, addressing structural issues in our society to change 
seize this opportunity and turn it into uh, 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 good opportunities. Concerning uh, cyber and the space, since there is nobody who addresses issues so closely linked, the space is a place where competitions are in, is being played out, and also space is a place to be used for uh, activities on the ground. So there are two dimensions, but both dimensions are closely connected with cyber issues. And cyber security is the most important, fundamental basic things in the activities for both domains. A third point is about uh, uh, what to do with uh, advice to uh, small countries, and I don't like the word small countries, but because I mean that each country is, uh, is in a kind of a similar condition in terms of cyber security. But as I said earlier, that the basic training of people, sensitizing people to a certain level, is uh, already something that you can do that. And it will solve about 70 or 80 percent of the problem. And so that uh, marginal utility is quite high, and we want to, we are ready to help uh, uh, under a bilateral assistance or quad or other uh, formula to those countries who wish to improve uh, cyber security e e in their country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Okano-san. Everyone Heinz. Okay, thank you. I I'm at the end, so I suspect I've got to go very quickly. But um, I'll start with Professor Chen. I, uh, yes, we are trying to look at the worst case scenario of GPT Chat, but I, I will also say that I really try to encourage us within the intelligence community to also look at the best case scenario when we are trying to think about these issues because it is very easy for us to focus only on the worst case scenario. That's our happy place, unfortunately. <laughs> and, uh, and so trying to make sure that we don't lose track of also what the opportunities are for technology is I think part of what we need to do and incorporate into our work. And I will just say that what they've come up with so far is really quite frightening. So um, I'll leave it at that. In terms of uh, the role of human intelligence in an uh, artificial intelligence world, I think was how you put it initially. Um, I, I very much agree with my colleague. I think there is no way we're losing the human being in essentially the loop that we have. And, um, and consistently, even as we're incorporating more artificial intelligence technology into our own work, we are consistently reminding ourselves of the importance of actually having human beings still who are, you know, uh, working things through to the extent that that was part of your, your question or the thrust of it. I, um, uh, yes, on, on the issue of, um, and I skipped this uh, question the last round, I think, in some respects, but it's sort of similar about advising smaller countries, as it was said, in bigger countries. It's probably, you're right, not the best way to think about this. but. But I think for countries that don't have as much money to spend, frankly, on cybersecurity, um, you know, in addition to the, the issues that Akhanasan uh, raised, I, I'd say also we really are working hard to, um, to provide more publicly available information about the cybersecurity threats that exist. And, uh, and I think that is a part of understanding that um, Cybersecurity is not something that you can simply manage within your own borders. This is something that extends to every country. So the stronger we all are, the better the system works. And very much also, as, as was earlier said by Okanasan, I think cyber hygiene is among the most effective things that we can do to actually promote cybersecurity. In other words, actually doing things like passwords and phishing, you know, and just responding appropriately, as also Mr. Chen said. I, so, um, so that's a, a piece of it. Um, and then uh, it also gives me an opportunity to say that, you know, in, in the context of um, where should we be investing uh, for the future, it, it, honestly, I do think, obviously, quantum computing is incredibly important, and we spend a lot of time recognizing and, and uh, advocating for the fact that quantum-resistant um, encryption is critical to the security of our uh, information. And increasingly, I think we recognize as technology is developing, and particularly artificial intelligence, data is an asset, and we have to protect our information in a variety of ways in that is another element or dimension of what you're describing, and I do think we have to invest in that. But I find the hardest thing is actually the public-private partnership piece. And, and just institutionally, organizationally, that is fundamental to actually getting this right. And 
it is really challenging to do correctly from a government perspective for a whole series of reasons for which we could have an entirely new panel. So I will uh, leave it, and I agree that we are increasing investment in space. I'll, I'll leave it with the kind of son's answer, but thank you very much. <laughs> Marvelous. Thank you very much, Avril um, Haines, uh, and, and uh, we are uh, pretty much uh, uh, exactly at our appointed closing uh, time. So um, what I would like to do is, uh, of course, thank, of all, thank all of you who have contributed with your comments and your questions, uh, and of course the wonderful panel that we had. I think it is interesting that from the perspective of the leader of the U.S. intelligence community, the deputy national security advisor, working in the, in the Prime Minister's office, the uh, uh, Defense Cyber Chief of uh, the Armed Forces and a, a Vice Minister of Defense. We had some, some common themes from slightly different angles, but I think that tells us something, um, namely that we are uh, uh, closing in on, on some really important issues uh, in, this, in this space now that uh, cyber as an issue is increasingly uh, linked to that uh, challenge of uh, technological competition, and, and I think that was a part of our conversation as well. So uh, can I invite you all to uh, thank our panel in the usual way for a really fantastic conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs>